Okay. Thank you, everyone. Apologies, we're running a few late because I'm with the schedule. So we're going to have Tom Jack going to. Thank you, on West Midlands. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Tom Good. Thanks for coming along. The, the focus of this presentation is a small suburb about 15 kilometres northeast of Perth. This, this study is part of a larger study which I've developed an interest in, which is a major project which I'm working on as a research topic. Now, I'm not associated with any university, so I don't have any problems with disciplinary matters. I don't <laughs> have any problems with departmental matters. I do have an interest in history. I'm a member of the Royal West Australian Historical Society. The major project concerned started out of my previous study into the railways, and I was interested in the way that the technology of the railways affected the society of Western Australia. So I got interested in the interplay of the two over the period. West Australia was chosen because it's a great place to do a case study. We're miles away from the eastern states. We've got desert to the north and the east. We've got ocean to the south and west. Right. So we're in an environment for independent thinking. I have a philosophy that the basic human needs haven't changed over time. Some people might disagree with that, but I so basically we still get hungry uh, now as they did previously. I came to illustrate this study when it's eventually completed, was looking at a couple of or some snapshots of West Australian location. Now, one of those was presented last year to the Royal West Australian Historical Society. When I looked at railways and the way it caused a couple of towns to disappear. And this one is the section in the series where I look at West Midland. Now, the combination of working out how to change this to just looking at the example, taking the example of food and transport as, as an outline of one of the streams of this research. In the pre European phase, which is pre 1829, the people in Western Australia were hunter gatherers, essentially. Phase two was the first European settlement. And this was quite interesting because it introduced the technology of the horse and the wheel, sea transport, but particularly a social structure that was based on land ownership, which was not known until that time, and also on to agriculture as a means of finding their food. Moving on, and we've just heard from Bill about the difficulties of the first settlement that went on. We look at railways and telegraph, which came on in 1870, and they moved things a little quicker. The motor car was king after 1940. And finally, we have the current phase, which involves the internet and the shopping centre. So these are the things which were technically involved in food and transport. You might get a feel for the width of this, but I'm also interested in what the impact of medical science would be 
on the train. So it's a listing. I'm retired. I can do this. <laughs> So sure, we're, getting, we're talking about, I'll talk a little bit about the Midland Civic Triangle and any of the locals who've driven out to the east who have gone past the Midland Town Hall. This was also to orient the people who perhaps were a little strange to the area. You can see down on the bottom left, UWA, which is where we are at the moment. Perth's highlighted, and Midland is up into the right top right hand corner. And it's very obvious why they use water transport up to Guildford as the main range of the early settlement. The only have to look at the park in this one collar. Anyway, back to the West Midland, the history of West Midland. This is the little area of West Midland. It's the area bounded by Great Eastern Highway and the railway, which runs over the Eastern State, and the Helena River in the south. On the east, which is the area just up here, we have the Cumberland School, but in actual fact, it's part of the original government area. Going back to Sterling's original grant, this was the area of Woodbridge, with the red dot represents roughly where the West Midland now is, and the green represents the side approximately of Sterling's Cottage. <laughs> Sterling's Cottage, of course, was where Ensign Dale started out from, and he headed east, and he paved the way to the path that went along Basically, avoiding the rivers, the rivers were subject to flooding, and that created a lot of problems for people who built their houses and were tapping over east at the moment down on the river flats. So they discovered that. So the result was the goods came up to Guildford by water and then by road or land across out to up the double between the rivers and out to the east or up to the north. And in actual fact, there is a story that the junction of the two tracks was named well before Midland arrived. The James Ford, 1884. It was an exciting time for railway fans. The Government had built the Perth to York first stage. They got out to Guildford and then to Chidlow's. And they'd also given two concessions to land grant railway companies, private companies, for 12,000 acres of land for each mile built. Great Southern Railway was able to connect or required to connect Albany to Beverly. And the Midland Railway Company was required to connect Guildford to walk away. And so that was the blue. So we we're going to focus on the Midland one because of the effect it had on the town of West Midland. The original site for the West Midland workshops is amongst the first bit of land grant. It's about 18 acres. It had the Eastern Railway on the south side and the York Road on the north. This was granted to the <coughs> this sorry. This the title is actually being dated considerably later because they took a while to catch up with the paperwork. But this became the focus to the railway there. I've indicated in the purple dots where the first subdivision was. And it was where the first house was built in the Midland. And it was the area just across the York Road from the workshops as they formed. The blokes got over there, and most of the workers, in actual fact, were living in tents. And there's some chap made the name for himself for building a house, and everybody stood around, shook their heads, and say, I'll never sell it. <laughs> However, Things progressed. The aerial photograph down the bottom right shows 
the workshops at Midland Railway Company, the Civic Centre, you can see basically the town hall clock there, and these shops along in here. It wasn't the Midland Railway Company that sparked West Midland though, it was the fact that the Government Railway was going to move out to Midland. And so a smart developer said, let's develop the Montreal estate. I have no idea where the name Montreal comes from, except that they did include a couple of roads. There, there's a Montreal and a Quebec. But the area, I, don't, I think it was because they used up all the north, south, east, and west divisions at that stage, probably. They had to make a name of themselves, marketing. But they ended up, the Midland Railway, this map shows the Midland Junction which in actual fact was from the north side, so even West Midland didn't fit. By 1903, it had stabilised considerably. But we had the Midland Railway Company workshops there, still in the triangle, boosted by the Government Railway workshops, which had taken a far larger area in the marked by the green dots, Midland Civic Centre, and finally, of course, West Midland. There. Now, that map looks 1903 and it looks quite dense and populated. And it was. Most of that was the surveyed areas and surveyed blocks. Quite a few of them were vacant. Um, as is shown later on. And in actual fact, the population of Midland at that time was about 2,200 people. Population WA at the same time was 230,000. So Midland represented about 1% of the population. The unique thing about Midland is that it was a town that was built for the railway. Now, if you think of the towns in Western Australia, most of them grew to service the agricultural industry and home. Midland is different in the sense that it was originally founded as a railway. And in actual fact, West Midland, Montreal Estate, was intended as a dormitory suburb, which is much more an English model than a, an Australian one. If you look closely at the um, Midland, you'll note that there are no public facilities in the suburb. They're basically houses. That was all they intended. Though the, the workers were to work there or from there to walk across to the workshops, the way they go. By using the Accounting, it was good fun to do. Um, the street directories were available from the turn of the century through until about 1940. You can get a number of the dwellings that are located in those houses. <clears throat> and as you can see, the biggest group, biggest building was in the first 10 years up to 1920. It steadied down after that. The population stabilised through the Depression. The workshops didn't take on a lot of new apprentices. They um, didn't take on, you know, if you hadn't been in register labour, you very likely got sacked. So by 1950, there were about uh, just over 140 houses. I want to have a closer look at this corner of Montreal estate. The reason that it, it shows, we're fortunate, they, it shows the sparseness of the area. The, in 1940, they planned to deep sewer the area, and so they conducted a detailed survey right through for everything to connect up. <coughs> this meant we have these plans which are available from the state records office. 
and they showed the houses, and you can have a look at what the house was, 1940, size of the block, and so on. From that, we can get the fact that there were vacant lots, and everybody had a big yard. Back to my original point about food supply, that was an important thing. Fruit trees, chook yard, uh, my own, my grandfather, who had one of the houses in the metro fact, ran hives, he had bees down the backyard, apparently, and so on. It's interesting to know there was other opportunities. There was an electrician, a builder, light engineering works still up the corner there. There was a sawmill in Archer Street. And I do like this because the school opened in 1834. By 1836, there was a school shop there. And if you drive around past any school that's been recently established in West Australia, I think within a block you will find that there was a shop. You can't find them now. There were three shops that serviced the area. One over in the corner by where I've got light engineering, another one up here and the school shop. The two over there were designed to catch the passing traffic to the Western Railway Station and, of course, the local one here. The shops were the traditional front room of the house. That's all they were. Um, the people lived on the premises. Um, once you knew your neighbours and knew who was who, they extended credit and things like that. Apart from the shops, we wanted more, you walked, and the original shops were along Great Eastern Highway. You walked up to the Pacific Triangle, which is the area marked up there, which had the commercial pharmacies, um, <clears throat> the larger shops. I've included in the circle Stafford Street because for some reason all the doctors like to gather there. Um, the Unzet Taker was an actual factor at the south end of Stafford Street, and the dentist was there. So they were all within a mile. So the whole side, you know, the requirement for replenishment was kept within that distance. There we go, the commercial centre. <laughs> The bicycle was a major form of transport. The whole area was a maze of bike tracks. And nobody seemed to worry about the bike track being in the middle of a railway line or over the crossings or something or other. Everybody used to walk up to the corner here and cross the road, cross the railway line, where there wasn't an official crossing, it was where the current road crossing is today. Nobody seemed to be worried about that. Um, yeah, you looked out for trains. Ten minutes up, by the issue. I want to briefly talk about the stretch east of Archer Street, which is marked in blue. This was, has quite a history of stock. Um, it was part of one side of the morgue. It's been a casualty ward. It was a small hospital. It ended up by 1940 having a sawmill. When the war, the school excised part of the site for the education department, and they built this little two room school, which had four classes, so it was an infant school. The buildings in the background have all been added since. The originals till they built in 1934. The school becomes important because of the way technology took people. And I we to switch now to 1940 at the outbreak of war. The area shown in pink or well colored was an actual fact a military supply depot. <coughs> the um, units are here, and it's the horse transport company which attracted me. I thought, you know, okay, that'll be a horse and cart and a couple of men. Till I looked up at its establishment, it was 60 men and 70 horses. 
So that's what they thought they needed to operate that supply depot of metal, which is an indication of how dependent we still were on board transport. I want to bring in the aeroplane. Let's go there go. The school site was there, the workshops were nearby. Broom was attacked in March, on the 3rd of March in 1942. On the 10th of March, the school population had moved to East Gilford. Interesting, this is the first occasion where technology in actual fact changed public opinion. Indeed. They moved the children out of there because of the risk of the workshop being bombed. East Gilford turned out to be not very comfortable for the teachers who negotiated the move. And they negotiated the move to the trains hall, which was the red dot right between two workshops. <laughs> um, this raised some eyebrows with some of the fans, uh, but they <clears throat> accepted it. And by 12 months, you know, 12 months on, everybody had come down a bit. They petitioned the parents, and the parents were happy, and everybody moved back to the original school. But it's an interesting sideline of where technology affects public opinion, but not very permanent. Going back to the original side, I did a quick count of the houses there. Approximately double the population, double the number of residences. The gardens have gone, and people are now have to get their food, most of their food, from the shop. So when we talk about technology in West Midland, its location was serviced by the need to service the railway technology. The house lots were large, the local shops provided limited credit. You could get horse-drawn regular deliveries of bread and milk. All the essentials were in the walking vehicle and so on. Uh, just a point about the relaxation, gambling, of course, was illegal, which makes it difficult to find any positive evidence about it. But I do know that there was two up ring down on the river in the workshops, which were well frequented. And if you crossed over the road to the railway hotel, since Saturday goes down, the, on Saturdays, yes, people be used to set up on the footpath outside. <laughs> Questions? Um, the, the, the government workshop was shifted from Fremantle to Midland. So That's right, right. Yeah. So it must be a really parallel story about what happened to Fremantle. A lot of people shifted out of Fremantle. Um, the actual fact, that's the reason why the railway station has moved. There were a lot of the workers came out by the suburban, what they call the Rattler. Well, that's they did the that was a suburban train. They didn't, they were really smart, you know, they were living in the western suburbs. <laughs> so they didn't move out voluntarily uh, out to Midland, but they used to come out regularly on train. There's a story of them going on a strike. And refusing overtime because the train would be 15 minutes late and all sorts of problems. Yeah, that's the reason why they could, didn't have the room at three man of the workshop. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the airport. I didn't get the airport from the airport story. Was there an airport? No, not an airport. No, it's just aeroplanes. Okay. You know, the threat of bombing. Yep. Was the thing in the change that the uh, public opinion had been well fed by the report, the Blitz in London, and so on, which everyone recalled. So, of course, there was some anxiety. There's correspondence where the school had people volunteered ready to dig slip trenches. All they wanted was the government to give them the stuff in that building. Yep. The government did. Yeah. So they knew. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Hi everyone, uh, it's great to be here and it's great, uh, it's an honor to present as, as my first presentation to a, a group of audience from economic history. So my name is Frank and this paper is titled Trading Activity and Sentiment on the Sydney Stock Exchange in New York 1, 950. And my call is that Grant Fleming, who is currently online, joining me, David Merritt and Sadler Neville. And I am a uh, finance uh, researcher trained in asset pricing and corporate governance. Uh, I have been doing sort of recent bit, bit and pieces in economic history since about 2018. And I'm just spoiled by the knowledge from my co-author team that, in fact, I don't actually know too much about history. I'm more focused on the methodology side and the data side. But it gave me an opportunity to, 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 to test different questions. So I guess, what is so important about this paper? From my point of view, from someone who's not about, not so interested in economic history per se, but trying to answer a question. So what do you do when you wake up in the morning? Maybe say hi to your partner, maybe say, well, I see, I'm late again. But when I wake up in the morning, I will, I will turn on my, my phone, go, ahead, go to marketplace, listen to what Kai Resta would offer, commentating on what happened in the US market, and then I would go on to Wall Street Journal website or can be app on my iPad, see what's going on, why there were currency sell-offs yesterday, and to learn whether there was similar voice on Financial Times, and then move back to Australian Financial Review. And after all that, during my breakfast time, I'll then go and check out what happened on Wall Street Bad. And because I've got another sort of two papers on Wall Street Bad, like with my PhD student. And then after that, after all this sort of um, like, you know, around people just then go on to Superstock. Has anyone heard about Superstock? Okay. I mean, probably, yeah, uh, um, Superstock is a subreddit created on Reddit that for people who are trying to get away from all the robot created by all the big firm, uh, sort of big trading company. So it's like a completely different financial market, completely different world, use completely different jargons. Like, not many people would understand what a daily library means, but you probably need a jargon to, to go through all that. But the point of story here is that what if you don't have any of that? What if you're going back to a period where, like, people just reading news <laughs> and they were not dedicated financial news for you to talk about it? So I guess the question that we would really focus on answering is that does market sentiment influence trading activity? I guess the answer is yes. Like without the the last couple of sentence, it is right. That's 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 what that's what we do. That's why I read and listen. Not to saying that you know I, I will argue against using farmers saying markets not efficient, but you know I just want to get get on top of the page, right? But the more important here is that it's in an environment where the dissemination of financial news is not by a dedicated financial news. How rare would you see that? Well, it turns out. We have that episode in our own history, right? So, but that, so, but let's just have an overall look at what you know what happened in the sort of the Australian economic research. So, um, so historians typically have access to macroeconomic database that you know you, you can see all the great links about 22 sources on A and U source papers in economic history. Also, RBA provided data which led to rich literature on Australian economic development. So we also have large sample company studies, which by my uh, the big end of town by my uh, co-worker team. Also looking at labor market studies and more. But then now with the new technology and data sources are increasingly available, maybe we have the ability to examine microeconomic behavior using this large data set. So what we do in this paper is using two novel data sets. What well, I mean, I, no, in terms of my opinion, right? Because then I don't know too much about economic history. But draws on two novel data sets to examine trading activity prior to 1950, which, as an example, to show what can be done with new data, specifically the digitalization of all the handwritten records. All right. So, what do we do in this paper? We're looking at trading activity sentiment, market sentiment, and we focus on Sydney Stock Exchange between 1901 and 1950. And I'm going to show you my findings just in case if I'm going to bore you over the next 15 minutes. So in terms of trading activity, 
we use two proxies, trading volume and ordering balance. So trading volume here is not a turnover, which I will uh, elaborate a bit later. And sentiment comes from the media-based sentiment index using the digitalized troll newspapers available from the National Library of Australia. And in a period where there were, there were at least six major regional exchanges, and we focus on Sydney, which was uh, uh, accepted from 1871. And over those 50 year period, we, we saw World War I, Great Depression, World War II, short sale bans, price restrictions, all the interesting stuff except my birth, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, that, you know, uh, so, but what about our findings? Trading volume wise, we see that there's a positive relationship between trading volume and sentiment, negative relationship between that and the ordering balance. We saw less of a trading in World War I, World War II, Great Depression, which probably people, people would say, you don't need a research to show that, right? We, we all knew about it. And then, but what's more interesting is that we show that before people went on holiday, a public holiday, not weekend, public holiday, people didn't tend to trade less. But when they came back from holidays, they tend to trade more. It looks like you put it, either get energized through the public holiday or you get more information exchanged over that time period. From the order imbalance point of view, we also see a positive relationship between sentiment and order imbalance, and a bit of sort of, you know, uncertain relationship in World War One, positive order imbalance in World War Two, and then negative that in Great Depression, which I will elaborate in, in a second. But what do we know about? So let's start from this corner. What do we know about Sydney stock exchange? There are studies of Australian stock exchanges in the 19th and 20th century that focused on institutional development, stock market returns, price earnings, and payout ratios, and role of capital market in mobilizing finance for resources of industrial sectors. And in terms of, in terms of like what actually been documented on about the Sydney Stock Exchange, is that during the World War, during the interwar years, is underdeveloped financial market infrastructure, which hampered underwriting and prohibited of advertising on new issues, approaching companies needing to raise new capital, and the exchange was self-governing, which was labeled as conservative, insular, and clubbish in the 1920s. And the, the, the book done by Salisbury and Sweeney on senior stock exchange is that they did not record any trading volume per se. So they didn't tell you the turnover, how many shares were exchanged hands. And David Gellman uh, showed that at the outset of World War I, the larger part of the stock exchange, the secret stock exchange, leads to consist of shares that were infrequently traded. And Fleming, Liu, Mary, and Bell talk about it. The trading of new equity insurance offered often suffered from sin trading, and underpricing was very poor, right? That's as far as what we know. And here are some other historical facts. We established in 1871, providing capital to many mining shares, copper, gold, and tin boom of the 1870s. And then between 1870 to 1890s, it was largely a mining exchange listed investment grade mining companies, the government debt from New South Wales government, and a range of industrial companies, which were treated quite differently to the mining companies, which we will see that later on in the, uh, the short sale banning. And it was remained as the second largest stock exchange in Australia until the post World War II period. And the setup of the Sydney Stock Exchange in London and the Melbourne Stock Exchange was trying to mimic what's happening in the London Stock Exchange. So there's an interesting paper about how you know how the London exchange, Stock Exchange influenced all the other regional exchanges. And it was self-regulated, except during World War II when wartime controls were introduced that introduced that pricing for share prices. And a number of companies that were available on the official list increased from 326 to 556 companies, and short selling were banned, but not banned in Great Britain. All right, so that's as much as what we know. Maybe you know more, but that's as much as I, what I knew. And I asked my course to say, do you know anything else? For example, like how many shares were trading on, um, I don't know, September 11th, 1921? No, no answer for that. But then, we came across with this uh, archive records that was digitalized by a, uh, by a. So here, I'll give you a sample of what was available. So this is the official list of price uh, for each trading session on a daily basis. Sydney Stock Exchange, for example, this one is Tuesday, October the 1st, 1901. 
and that shows all the tradable securities on that day. If you zoom in a little bit, to show you that what was the closing price, for example, like um, over here, maybe it's too small, but Blaney Mining had a sell, and the sellers put a price about seven shillings and uh, seven, yeah, seven, seven shillings and three pennies. And uh, no, there's no buys, but there's a sell, the sell call. So, and there were no sales taking place. Basically, there was an offer price, there's no bid price. And then if you look across and say, well, I mean, visually, I can see that not every share was traded. You can immediately arrive at that conclusion, right? Not everyone was traded, right? And there were not too many sales taking place. Just on that page, there's one, which is over here. Associated gold dragon. So what, what is the challenge? So we have we have this. We have about seven terabytes of data, right? Which is huge, right? <laughs> By any measure, right? It's seven terabytes of data. I have one terabyte memory in my phone, but seven of them. And I've only used about, I don't know, like one tenth of that since two years ago. So scale, there are about 199 volumes of that. And the structure, structure wise, is great because they have followed a particular structure. You have rows and columns and print and handwriting. So we follow, well, not, not we follow, but Tim Sherratt, which is a librarian uh, from um, National Library of Australia, he pioneered the, te uh, the techniques to do that. We basically just saying, well, he did a marvelous job. It's, it's unfortunate no one is using it, right? So, so what did he do? He said, okay, if you look across, if you find a pattern, there's, there's a pattern to it. Sometimes there are three columns of information. Sometimes you have four, sometimes you have two, but it's not too hard for you to program that to say, you know, there's a way for you to extract information separately and not reading the whole rows across the solid line, right? And they use the headers. So here we have a hand a handwritten uh, text. We have a sort of op the, um, the computer printout, optical character. Uh, over here, written tell you signal stock chain. There's also another handwritten show, uh, text showing you that was Monday, January 7th, 1901, which is, was seven to be the first day in our sample. So here you get, so you get the exact format. Maybe you can just extract the grid from the page features to somehow figure out get all the information and then get that column pending that one, the last one, the third column pending the second one and pending the first one. You can do that, just elaborate, and you can pretty much without, uh, you know, with about, I don't know, 99% confidence, you can get all this tags using the OCR, which is optical character recognition, which has been kind of mature since 1980, right? That's, that's why we can scan and read the text. But we are still on the sort of uh, developing stage with the handwritten uh, text recognition. So which means, for example, if you see that one, 31 shillings, you will recognize that 31 slash, 32 shillings slash six, you will be recognized as 3216, which means that, wow, that's a, that would be a very expensive spot to buy, right? <laughs> um, and so which means that how would you be able to use that information I guess he presented in, in, in the sense is that that would, there must be a technological uh, constraint, right? Here's a challenge. If someone's good at uh, programming, maybe you can figure out how to how to do that, right? So, but then basically you're saying, okay, there's probably not much you can do. So, how useful is data? I guess we start from the not the sort of like the downside is that it's not able to tell you a security name. Why? Because if you look at it, there was this dot 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 here. Sometimes it's saying blending money corporate company, and the second one is blending money contributing, but they're not necessarily repeating that word. So which means that you could have blending money here, but that might be a different one to the one in like uh, showed up on a different section because it really depends on which section that really belongs to, right? And we because you can't actually read the number correctly, so you can't get a five. If you can't get a price, you can't get a return. And then and that will reject 99.95% of the finance research. Say, okay, if I can't get a price, can't get a return, I'm not interested, right? I, I need to move on, right? I got better things to do in my life. And and because you can't recognize names, you can't actually identify listing and delisting per se, the inclusion to the official list and the removal of that, because that's also very interesting, because that's about attention. And so so and then you can't study risk premium 
unfortunately. But on the bright side, you are able to looking at just count how many tradable securities in general. Because basically, if you look at it, removing the handle of copper, tin, silver, and the count number of rows over here without the blank rows, that's roughly about 18 tradable securities over there. And out of the 18 tradable securities, zero receive a sales. And about six of them, five of them receive a buys quote. And about another five coming from sales quote. And that itself turns something that you can't quantify into a binary variable that may be of interest. So, so, and that's what we did. So we define our trading volume as number of securities that has sales over the total number of tradable securities, which is over the entire day. And ordering balance is the number of securities that had a bid price over the number of securities that had an offer price. Very straightforward. Not about turn, turnover. Uh, you know, we wish we had the data, but we don't. Right? It's really just based on what we can get from the data set. So interesting about sentiment over here. How do we actually quantify or proxy for the sentiment in the market? So the media sentiment is that reporting of daily financial news in Australia was primarily through the Sydney and Melbourne newspapers. And the Sydney Morning Herald, Daily Paragraphs in Sydney, The Age, The August, The Herald from Melbourne. And the AFR that most people read today and pay the AFR tax every now and then is that they only started in 1951, which is just one year after this digitalization record finished. Unfortunately, it, I'm not sure why AU didn't decide to keep, keep going with that, but it did stop perfectly on 1950 and then AFR started in 1951. Which, and then the newspapers typically provided commentary of the previous day's market activity, end of day prices of the leading companies, and index of Sydney stock exchange prices between 1901 and 1940 was made available in Daily Telegraph. And from the Sydney stock exchange itself, they made something similar to that, provided an index from 1938, which they backdated to 1928 and was available. There's no daily or regular financial newspapers such as the Financial Times or Wall Street Journal. And there were no regular columns in the daily newspapers. And the tone of financial news was typically manifest by whether the newspaper reported as here we have an active market, here we have a quiet market, and but there was no regular columns to talk about the actual market itself, right? Not on page one, not on page two, not on the last page. So if you go to Trove, which is available if you search Trove, the National Library of Australia, I'm sure everyone knows, because I'm the one who didn't know about this. I was like, wow, this blew my mind, right? So what we did is that we searched three newspapers in, in Sydney, Daily Telegraph, the Sydney Morning Arrow, and Sun, and we follow two papers in finance that are trying to, trying to count the number of positive words over the number of negative words in any particular article to proxy for the, input, for the, for the tone of the of message. For the investor sentiment. So, and we use two combinations of words for positivity and negativity. Share price, active price, and excluding inactive dollar and quiet as the positivity, share market being quiet, share market quiet, three words actually, as a proxy for negativity. And um, show you a, um, so if you go to the, uh, the troll website, and if you search for share market active, it will return to result like this, and then you can select the sample that you want to look at, in this case, and we just have to repeat it sort of on a daily basis using the, uh, the API provided by Team Shira. We didn't do it manually through this way, but this is the demonstration. And then if you click on, say, any article, it will show you there was, there was a section talk about share market active and firm. I guess that's for really a you know, uh, I guess self-evident to say maybe the previous day was an active market, right? See some firm, act, firm action, and so, uh, and then um, so, yeah. And then I, I, all the other that you read are not going to be counted uh, towards this particular text. Share market quiet all around, and that's another example about mining. So what we do is that we count the number of articles, not number of words within each article, because that would be quite biased. Number of articles that contain positive words over a number of articles that contain the negative words in this case. 
And now let's move on to this time period, right? So, well, you know, there's a lot happened in those 15 years, right? Uh, so since the you know, Federation of Australia, World War One, World War Two, you can tell by just different, different, you know, different war equipment and Great Depression and the drought in Australia in 1902, I think. And you can think about this as a time period where it provides several natural experiments, which is associated with any event that is just very, very interesting over the last century. So, and stock market investors were predominantly, in our sample, individuals as opposed to institutional investors from the 1980s onward, and hedge funds and algo trading firms from the 2000s. And then since 2016 onwards, teens, ages, with trading cryptocurrencies. Here, where self regulated stock market was the norm, right? A lack of clearly defined set of accounting standards, no credit rating agencies, and period of substantial technological change and the emergence of new consumer products, and IPs of, of new companies in new industries and products with little historical information on potential market structure. Ten minutes, you're going to frame any blue discussion. Okay, cool. All right. So we can break our sample down into this eight period where from January 1st, 1901 to 31st, 1902, it was Federation drought. And we then have a period about 11 years between 1903 and 1914 as a pre-World War I, World War I between 1914 and 1918, peace times 1929, Great Depression, peace times World War II, World War II, and then post-World War II between 1945 to 1950. And then we have some further breakdown of the uh, samples, right? But that's what kind of result. So when I so when I made this plot, because uh, uh, really we, we started this project since August this year, it has been it hasn't been too much. We have, uh, but it has we haven't spent too much time in it. But when I first produced this out, I was like, wow, that's so interesting. And let me show you why that's interesting. So um so over here we have the trading volume indicated by the dot over here going from about 0% to about maximum less than 25%, which means on any given day, the maximum trading volume you can see, traded stocks over as tradable sort of stocks, was 25%. And this smooth line over here, across from left to right, is the smoothest ordering balance, which means that it's number of buys over number of sales. And I guess your, your attention will be drawn to this, what happened over here, right? Well, I will show you what happened over there. And then and then what I further do was that here, I just wanted to say, because back then we had six days of trading, not five days. There was a trading session on Saturday until 1946, I think. And so I so I guess the first question to myself was that was there anything different on on, on the weekend, right? Because that's what finance wanted to know. Whether there was any weekend effect, right? So here you can see that the weekend was labeled as triangle, whereas the weekday is the circle. And I guess it's quite apparent that the triangles are much lower over there. So even though they, there was trading available throughout from 1901 to 1946, but people tend to trade less on Saturdays. I guess people had life, right? Uh, unlike today. And then we broke this by different, different color, right? And but then we, we have different ways to color it, but but, I, but overall, here you can see that, actually, let's just see, look at this, this one. We can see that this particular line over here, where we see the ordering balance goes up, which means there are more buyers than sellers, a lot more, a lot more than the moving average across the entire period, was caused, or well, not caused, but associated with, gotta be careful with the, with the word cost, associated with the government reprice restriction over that time period. There was an institutional change and a regulation from the government showing basically you, you have a you have a ceiling for prices. You can't buy and sell a sell. The price can't be more than 10% or less than 10% of a rapid price. And what's more interesting on this same graph over here is the black line surround is our media sentiment. As you can see, probably you would say vaguely they are kind of correlated, right? Vaguely they are correlated over here. But I guess, I mean, let's say if, if, uh, if I were a true historian, I would say, wow, that's, that's fascinating because there, there isn't a constant of trading volume volatility throughout the period. 
it does go up and down and no one has seen this before. And you probably the first group of audience ever saw this. What was the trading on a day, on any given day, over the last 50 years on single stock exchange, right? But it does vary a lot. So that was the price restriction we talked about. To explain that the period which was announced on 10th of February 1942, which took place from 19th February onward, and which means that share could not be sold if held for less than five months. They were to be per permitted only within 10% of a reference price, not 10% of yesterday's price, but 10% of a long-term reference price that was periodically revised and later applied to applied ceiling prices. And the price distortion comparing New Zealand market, for example, in June 1945, PHP was traded at 44.9 in New Zealand against the ceiling of 40 shillings in Australia. So I guess if you could somehow figure out a way to efficiently travel between these two places, you probably could find, find out a market charge, um, unlikely. And so, well, so what are some interesting results? So here are summary statistics. This is just hope on the table, a lot of numbers. But let's just talk about, for example, media sentiment. We tend to always have more negative words, quiet than positive words. So on average, it's 20% on daily basis. And trading activity wise, about 6.7% of stock were traded on average. Let's say during the two, uh, during the World Wars, during World War One and World War Two, it is a lot lower than that, which see a 4.2% on average traded in World War One, 5.1%. Uh, in World War II, and during the short sale ban, sorry, during the price restriction that we talked about, there's about 4.8 cent stock were traded. We saw a much higher average of order imbalance, about 3.7 times more buyers than sellers in that time period compared to the rest of the, of, of the market. So here's some regression analysis, you know, uh, just to wrap up the talk. So media sentiment is on average positively related to the trading volume, which means that the positive, the, the, the newspaper sounds from yesterday, the more trading done today. And we saw that the World War One saw a smaller trading volume, same in World War Two, not so much of a difference in Great Depression compared to the rest of the sample. Interesting. And the media sentiment during World War One is more pronounced, about 6.4% more pronounced, which means that during World War One, if you see a much positive tone from the newspapers, it actually leads to higher trading. And we don't see that in World War Two, nor in the Great Depression mm -hmm. over here. It's quite contrary to what it what was supposed to find in the US. Similar story in the order imbalance that the media sentiment has a, on average a positive relationship with the order imbalance, more positive word from the newspapers, more bias. And during World War I, so they saw a decrease in order imbalance, more people want to buy stocks in World War II, but we, but, but we suspect that's because of the uh, price res uh, restrictions in place in that period, rather than the World War II effect itself, but also from regulation in the market. And Great Depression, less order imbalance, less, less buyers, more sellers in that sense. And we also categorize sort of according to a score in the UF is that like looking at, you know, let's say if you look at 50 years, 36 years roughly had a positive real GDP, 14 years had a contraction which is negative real GDP. How would that, see, how would you see a difference? So during the expansion years, you do see a larger trading volume, and during uh, and then in terms of the sort of the media sentiment interact with the expanding years. That during the expanding years, the more positive the, the media sounds from the newspapers, it leads to more trading volume, and you can see that over here. I can and do a chart square comparing the expanding years versus the contraction years. You do see that the media sentiment plays a bigger role in the expanding years compared to the contraction years. Show some events. Let's just talk about the media sentiment versus the reprise restrictions as, as what we saw before. During, so between 1942 to 1946, there was a regulation placed by the government saying, you know, price comes, comes to move freely. 
right? You can't just keep buying. You can't just keep selling. You have to own the shares for less for more than six months. Okay. And you might want to wrap up now so we can have some discussion. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, there's a positive related to the reprise during that time. You see more high trading volume, and that just coincides with the uh, the Salisbury paper. Like they just document that there were one more buyer in that period, right? And we were very happy to find something. Uh, personally, I was very happy to find something that really described mimicking what was described in the history, for example. And so that there's a much higher, much more buyers over there. Okay. And then we also saw the holiday effect, but basically just showing you people tend to trade less before holiday, they trade more when they come back from a holiday. <laughs> so what is so important, what's the implication is that maybe we can do that and roll out to all the other exchanges and looking at whether we see a similar effect and plus, how would you see the information transmission, dissemination differs across exchanges and, and, and you can also look at stock that cold is taking all the different stocks, right? And thank you very much. Thanks, Harvey. I think the fifth. No, all right. So questions. Um, Frank, thank you very much. You know, it's a fascinating analysis, right? Um, I have just three very quick points, right? So first one, have you been thinking of using the event study analysis, right? Uh, because I think that basically you could use the type of event study simply to see what changes might be observed in the distribution of trading volume and order in balance, right? Yeah. Because essentially you have a shock, like a variety of restrictions, global one, global two. It would be interesting to see yeah. if post event basically coefficients differ from the event coefficients, right? Yeah. Then, second of all, um, I didn't know basically in your table, did you cluster robust? Did you, did you robustify standard errors? I did not know. So basically, because you have a couple of or a couple of dimensions of observation. So basically, you observe it on time, on sector, maybe, right? So yeah. you could use this uh, Cameron Gilbert Miller multi way clustering scheme, right? I think it would be very beneficial, right? To diversify the standard errors. And so third of all, did you check for stationarity with unit root tests, right? Because during these periods, right, of upswings and downswings, right, you might be, I mean, there might be severe non stationarity. So, yeah. I mean, I don't think it will change anything, but just in the worst case, you might be tempted to do the first difference transformation and see if anything changes in the underlying coefficients. Thank you. Yeah, I think we, we did a third one, but we didn't do the first thing. Yeah. My, my only comment there, Frank, is to be good to know how good your sentiment index is from this content analysis of the newspapers. Yeah. Perhaps by doing the same thing for 2022 okay. and comparing it to a modern Sentiment of consumer index. I have a clear correlation. Yeah. Um, Remember, I don't think it's digitized for 2022. Right? Yeah, so it only goes up to the 80s. So you potentially can do it for the 80s. Yeah, where there is the index. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, a good, that's a good question. Yeah. That's, a, that's a good suggestion. Okay. Oh, sorry. Our trove goes off in detail to 1954. Right. And then it rolls into copyright issues. Yeah. yeah. The big comments are when you're doing the um, OCR or the handwritten document for the other stock exchange list. Did you build a bespoke dictionary for the OCR work? I uh, know. I mean, um, um, not according to what Tim Shira built out his algorithm yeah. from the from his code. I, I don't think so. Yeah, because I've seen recently another AI project that they got around a lot of problems you mentioned by building a bespoke dictionary oh, wow. that allowed um, millions of pages of geological reports. I see. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Frank. Okay, we've got Dean Goblowski here today, who's coming from the East and Dean's in Australia under a full grown arrangement. So welcome to Australia, welcome to the WA, and we look to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. I'm just going to try to navigate and negotiate myself around here. And oh, sorry, it's, it's in, and I, I should we just yep, yeah, yep, should be. What is the Indian point? Well, I'm going to talk about oh. the Indian point. For <laughs> you. So, and I'm going to talk about what happened. But before I do that, I would like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land. Uh, on which we meet so their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging. In this presentation, I will use 
the words Native Americans and Indigenous peoples, but also American Indians and Indians interchangeably. Right? And I want to especially thank David and Michael for um, arranging for me to come out here with an invitation. And this is a subject about American history, American international history. But uh, uh, I figured out a way of, of bringing Australia into this. I'm working on a, a book about US indigenous policy from Truman to Clinton, and then a follow-up book comparing the, U, the US and Australia in the same period. And I don't know why I'm leaning into this microphone. I don't think it helped me very much, but it, it certainly looks good. It gives me a sense of authority here. So let me just jump in by saying that during the 1950s and 1960s, assimilationism defined indigenous policy in Australia and in the United States. In 1952, Paul Haslick, Minister for the Territories, made the aims of Australia's policy clear. Quote, assimilation means that eventually, as they make progress, all Aboriginal people will live as we do, end quote. Enjoying, quote unquote, European standards of living. In 1954, Haslick saw signs of progress, a favorite word of US liberals. Quote, during the Canberra Royal Visit, Albert Namajira and Maureen, a native, a Darwin native boy, were both presented to Her Majesty. They were both dressed perfectly in gleaming white tropical suits, and they conducted themselves with great dignity and no sign of self-consciousness. I think their visit to Canberra did good in showing people how well conducted the Aborigines can be." End quote. Settler colonial, Eurocentric, and even racist thinking was also evident in Washington, D.C. In 1963, Senator Millward Simpson of Wyoming complained that Indians and Americans generally were, quote, losing the initiative and pioneering spirit that made this country great, end quote. He seemed unaware that the ways of European settlers had had a tragic impact on indigenous peoples. Yet liberal assimilationism in the United States manifested itself more subtly in talk of integration of indigenous peoples in the larger society, and uh, specifically here with the US, an emphasis on the economic development of Indian reservations. And I do have some images here, just a little bit in terms of comparison. There are Australian government publications, and you'll see strong comparisons here between Australia and the United States, strong similarities, I think. I think you get the idea here of integration and assimilation. I do not make a strong distinction between the two. And I'm going to be very firm about that okay? and in both countries. I thought here in Australia, you made a stronger distinction. I don't think you did. All right. This is again, from another government pamphlet, again, issued by the, the Department of the Territories. I think it's very self-explanatory. You get the idea of modernization and modern equipment. Let's take a look at the United States. This is in the liberal Johnson period, okay? Here's the United States celebration of modernization. Native Americans using uh, all sorts of uh, mechanical equipment, modern schools. There was a teacher, does not seem to be American Indian. And then this is something that actually harks, harks back to earlier assimilationist policies. And I think that that's a dy very dynamic picture of what's going on here. Uh, yesterday, the warrior, today, the welder. Uh, there were images here in the United States, the period that in American history, I'll use we here, identify with the US. That period of assimilation where that word was used was late 1800s, early 1900s. After the post-war period, post-World War II, liberals favored using the word integration. And I don't think that they made a strong distinction between the two. And you know what? Conceptually, I'm not gonna make a strong distinction between the two. Um, Harry S. Truman's foreign aid program, the point four, inspired a push to modernize Indian reservations. Truman's initiative sought to provide countries, this is foreign countries, with technical assistance so that they might develop thriving economies and become allies of the United States. Leading liberals, some conservatives, and some American Indian leaders and activists saw, for differing reasons, benefits in extending the point for to Indian tribes. Raising Indian standards of living would ease their entry into the wider society Names shared by conservatives and liberals alike. Point four also became a flag around which Indians and concerned liberals rallied as they sought to slow or stop the US government's termination policy 
of the 1950s and 1960s, which sought to end the rights of federally recognized tribes and encourage the movement of Indians into the wider society. So I don't want to go into the details of the termination policy right now. It was bad. OK, it was designed. Can you I mean, just the name termination, right? Uh, it meant getting rid of essentially the treaties and putting Indians in again into the wider society on the same basis as non Indian Americans. Uh, but Indian rights activists envisioned this point four as a way to empower tribes with technical know how and to revitalize reservations econ economically and thus to perpetuate the authority of the tribes as separate entities. For national politicians, point four became a catchphrase that promised financial assistance and integration to Indians. The talk of economic development of an, and of an Indian point four receded as John F. Kennedy, as John F. Kennedy, as the John F. Kennedy administration's quote unquote new trail for Indians relied on modest funding hikes for Indian housing, education, and job training. Lyndon B. Johnson's government also put emphasis on economic help for tribes in order to promote Indians' entrance into what liberals repeatedly called the American mainstream. But Indian leaders' dreams of asserting control of their resources and futures as sovereign entities, a concept embodied at least somewhat in the Indian Point Four, endured. It received a somewhat unintentional boost from the War on Poverty's Community Action Program under LBJ. In some respects, the stillborn, but somewhat tribal friendly Indian point four sowed the seeds of American Indian self determination. To go back to the origins of this point four, point four originated in President Harry S. Truman's 1949 inaugural address. After pledging support for the United Nations, the Marshall Plan, regional alliances, the president announced a fourth imperative. That America's industrial know how could be used for the improvement of what he called underdeveloped areas, even around the globe. Long term goals included the improvement of food distribution, transportation, health care, and vocational education. Truman deemed point four the means to quote unquote better living for more and more people who would be able to purchase US goods. It also promised an antidote to stomach communism or Soviet influence among the world's hungry people. Congress delayed enactment of the point four until 1950 when it approved uh, an appropriation of about $27 million, a very modest program that Truman nevertheless trumpeted as, quote, the world's best hope for peace and security, end quote. The willingness of liberals to apply, apply the concept of economic development to Indian reservations in, in the United States was coupled by Indian leaders' efforts to use point four to advance tribal self-determination, again, greater authority for their tribes. Inspired by foreign policymakers who pushed to modernize the nation states of the global south, liberals sought to raise the living standards of Indians, improve their skills, and ease their entry again into the wider society. As the historian Dan Cobb, Cobb has asserted, quote, modernization envisioned both transformation and assimilation. And I think you get that idea here very well. Speaking before the National Congress of American Indians, which was the oldest and still is the oldest and Indian um, organization in the United States, in 1951, E.R.C. McNichol, uh, Salish Kootenai, uh, argued that foreign aid style technical assistance to tribes would alleviate the destitution, disease, inadequate education and quote unquote lack of community acceptance that kept Indians, as he put it, from intermixing with non-Indians. But McNichol had another agenda here. He also knew that the rhetoric and the mechanics of modernization promised to reinvigorate tribal authority. It quieted talk of closing down the Bureau of Indian Affairs or the BIA, refocused policy away from termination, and reimagined reservations as underdeveloped areas ripe for planning and economic growth. Most important, the Indian Point Four concept legitimized added assistance to tribes while encouraging Indian leaders to design their own future. The Point Four idea promised 
tribal empowerment without being too radical. And the National Congress of American Indians worked very hard to keep it that way. The NCAA's messaging remains steadfast. Self-sufficient reservations infused with federal dollars and technical know-how would enable Indians to retain their culture and tribal bonds rather than to forsake reservations for an alien life in cities. In an address to the NCAI, the anthropologist Saul Tax hailed what he called reservation development as the way, quote, to protect the land base for the Indians who want to remain in their communities, end quote. Tax, along with McNichol, later organized the American Indian Chicago Conference of 1961, whose Declaration of Indian Purpose, this is again a major document that is often um, cited, uh, it, that document urged an end to the termination policy and greater federal funds for tribal planning and development, quote, similar to a point four plan. And at a White House event, President Kennedy accepted a copy of this declaration from tribal leaders. Kennedy had endorsed a liberal version and we're talking about a liberal political version, kind of like a mainstream politician's version of this Indian point four during the 1960 campaign. As he put it, he championed a, quote, democratic point four program, end quote, to assist, quote, underdeveloped areas, end quote, in the United States, which would include Indian reservations. So he really broadened this out. Yet, save for a pledge to promote community development, the empowerment of tribes never became a leading issue for John F. Kennedy. And the new frontier offered American Indians little beyond integration into the wider society. The Democratic nominee's statement on Indian affairs in the 1960 campaign about investment in projects to help all Americans in need, vocational training, federally funded housing, aid education, area redevelopment. An amalgam of partisan politics and ideology shaped his proposals. Kennedy envisioned Indians as integral to and integrated within the dynamic, prosperous society he sought to achieve, one that of course would compete um, against the Soviet Union. The Indians would have, as he put it, new opportunities not only as Americans of Indian descent, but as American citizens to participate in federal programs, improve their livelihoods, and build an America free from quote unquote poverty and disease. Richard Nixon, Republican nominee that year, he also backed expanded education, vocational training, and resource development for Indians. But I think this is very important. Nixon did not use the point four moniker or label. Republicans had little use for that label that had become so identified with the Democrats. Indeed, as a presidential candidate in 1952, Dwight D. Eisenhower privately disparaged the overseas version of the point four. Of course, what he's going to do is he's going to have his own foreign aid program, um, emphasizing more military aid, not called the point four. As president, Dwight Eisenhower did not endorse, endorse resolutions for an Indian point four that Senate liberals, especially in the mid and late 50s, were um, uh, intermittently pushing. The priorities of those in power partially explained the failure to enact an Indian Point Four program. The idea mattered most to the NCAI and to Indian leaders who sought empowerment through federal funding, technical assistance, and tribal planning. If the NCAI, again, the National Congress of American Indians, lacked the clout to enact tribal friendly legislation along the lines of the Indian Point Four. Supporters of termination in the U.S. Senate had little use for the Indian Point Four as its purpose to strengthen tribes became clear. And I noticed one of the leading figures in this drive to terminate the tribes, right, and their federal, their special federal status, uh, his, his name is Clinton Anderson. He was a senator from New Mexico. He was a Democrat, and he was a liberal. He was very close to Truman and to, to LBJ. And read his newsletters. He endorsed the point four. And then you know what? He, didn't, he, he sort of dropped it. He never mentioned it. Because I think for Anderson, when the point four was there, you know, you develop Indians, you would lift them up economically, they get to enter and it eases their entry into the wider society. He liked that. But it became clear that this might be a mechanism to empower and to economically revitalize reservations and perpetuate tribes 
didn't like that. And his staff member, uh, James Gamble, uh, complained about this by the period of Kennedy's presidency. Gamble complained that this is again an aide very closely to Clinton Anderson. Grassroots efforts, quote, to prick the national conscience about the plight of Indians and thereby to gain support for a point four type program. Five months into JFK's presidency, Gamble also was a pretty strong supporter of his termination policy, vented that, quote, no one in the government has attempted to counter this type of pro tribal propaganda, but any commissioner of Indian affairs will do so, try to do so. Gamble protested too much for Kennedy's Indian policy only very moderate behavior in tribes. Kennedy administration steeped in assimilationist thinking accented economic assistance in general over tribal empowerment. Economic aid initiatives unfolded in a piecemeal fashion with an emphasis on helping Americans generally rather than Indians specifically. Most programs posted modest outcomes at best. Investment in the training of workers the light motif of JFK's New Frontier received a boost from the Area Redevelopment Act, which sought to funnel federal aid and dollars into what were called hard hit areas. 42 Indian reservations claimed some funding under the RAR. This was a very small program that just added about $94 million to existing loan programs. And a lot of that money went into states like West Virginia, where Kennedy had campaign, which had these long-suffering coal miners and so on and so forth, did not have very many American Indians. By 1964, tribes had gained a little under $5 million in assistance. Reservations experienced little change. DRC McNichol regretted that the government's conventional training courses, as he called it, failed to prepare, quote, Indians to work with Indians, end quote, or to run large-scale enterprises. Reservations, he asserted, required far-seeing leaders, quote, who can move their people into more favorable economic circumstances rather than creating, as he put it, more bricklayers and blowers. Re Reliance on old line bureaucrats and subpar oversight further hampered the BIA's efforts to encourage industrial development on or near reservations. Not surprisingly, the aim of economic development and the slogan Indian Point Four was seeded during the Canadian years. McNichol's vision persisted, however, and the fact that American Indians angled to bend assistance programs to their own ends should surprise no one familiar with U.S. foreign aid. The U.S. government sent financial assistance to countries in the global south in order to alleviate poverty, to develop viable economies attuned to the wants of average people, and to build regimes friendly to U.S. interests. Uh, yet leaders in Asia, for example, often used U.S. assistance to pursue their own agendas. In Pakistan, government officials utilized U.S. economic and military assistance to remain in power and to re prepare for a possible war with India rather than to become a steadfast client of the United States. As the historian Robert J. McMahon noted, the unintended, his quote from McMahon, the unintended consequences of American actions often prove at least as important as the intended ones. Mm -hmm. Federal Indian policy produced unintended consequences for which the war on poverty proved a catalyst. In launching this policy, President Lyndon B. Johnson made grand, if predictable, promises to American Indians. At an event with leaders of the NCAI at the White House, Johnson vowed to put Indians in the forefront of our attack on poverty. Weapons in this fight included greater outlays for Indian education, housing and health care, as well as programs to modernize reservations from public works, increase credit, industrial plants, and the development of natural resources. Yet LBJ had scant interest in Indian policy or in the operational details of the war on poverty, and he acknowledged little unique in Indians' experience with want and disease, which he called, quote, the ancient enemies of mankind. So de-exceptionalizing the Indian experience with poverty. Over time, however, his advisors sensed that Indians could be drawn into the War on Poverty's Community Action Program, which envisioned planning roles for poor people. The CAP pumped dollars into tribes and trusted them to run programs like Head Start, promoted Indian rights through the Legal Services Program, and opened leadership opportunities for many younger Indians. Maximum feasible participation and local initiative 
hallmarks of the community action program provided Indian communities with the latitude necessary to affect these changes. Building upon the Indian Point 4, the Community Action Program empowered tribes, encouraged Indian leaders, and boosted Indian self-determination. Defined by a recorder, I notice I've been throwing that term Indian self-determination around quite a bit, now I'm going to actually define it here, um, as quote, giving federally recognized tribes greater control over their existence without ending the federal trust responsibility. And a number of leaders in the NCAI were very praiseworthy of these programs and um, of the war on poverty and the community action program. Uh, the Johnson administration, however, never fully understood these changes related to the CIP or to Indian demands for self-determination. Um, instead, the administration, and steeped in assimilationist thinking, hailed Indian involvement in such great society initiatives as model cities, Lady Bird's Beautification Project, where it was said, the quote unquote facelifting of reservations uh, would bolster tourism and morale. Interior Secretary Stuart L. Udall felt besieged when an Indian resources development bill drafted without Indian participation through, part through protest from Indian leaders. The Johnson years, uh, the president began to respond to pressures by, by Indian tribes for some for a greater self-determination near the end of his presidency in an election year message um, that endorsed self-determination daily without repudiating termination. I'll conclude here. The Johnson years marked a time of transition during which the U.S. government encouraged tribal self-determination, albeit only to a point. White House's endorsement in 1968, again in that Indian message, of quote, self-help, self-development, and self-determination, end quote, suggested a desire to be seen as sympathetic toward Native peoples and agency without abandoning ethnocentric shibboleths about the value of economic modernization and the desire for racial integration. Tribes nevertheless reaped some benefits from, the, from Johnson's Great Society and War and Poverty from, grad, from the infusion of badly needed cash to the opportunity and under that community action program to run a few federal programs themselves. The mixed le record left Indians wanting more, looking ahead to a new administration with anticipation, concern, and hope. And I probably should, should do a little brief recap. So what did happen to the Indian point four? Well, the, the label really evolved and it died during the Kennedy years. And what was kind of left over were probably about three things. The idea of expanded, some sort of expanded assistance to Indians and to tribes um, that, you know, endured. An idea of modernizing tribes, you know, and again, these are kind of liberal mainstream, um, you know, government programs. But, but also what survived was that idea of using this point for and using this technical assistance by Indian leaders to, you know, bolster their own institutions. And I think that that is very, very significant. And it gets reborn, I think, at least in spirit, with LBJ's community action program. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, questions? Are the American Indians well represented in their government? I sense a little bit of a comparative uh, sentiment behind that with Australia and the idea of the, the voice. So American Indians, uh, you know, I mean, they are represented in the U.S. Constitution. And the federal government, not the states, gets to control Indian affairs. So that's a big difference between U.S. and Australia. But um, there is not, you know, so American Indian leaders, this is, again, a kind of form of integration. They can run for, for Congress, seats in Congress and the Senate. And I think there are a larger number than, is, than ever before. But, you know, they also have these separate entities and they have, um, they can run you know, for the chairman of their tribes. And so they have, they have that political venue. Yeah. Yeah. Staying with the comparative thing, the voice you mentioned, the, the other one which we have is, uh, made it is tricky, particularly because of you know, New Zealand's experience with the experience of any end. Is there any equipment tricky in the United States? No, but this is tricky. Yeah, 
you've got essentially your empowerment autonomy theme. Has it been successful in improving autonomy and empowerment? Were those really not been successful? Well, I, th I think there are a couple of things going on here. The U um, U.S. Indian tribes, federally recognized tribes, have these treaties with the federal government that protects their rights mm -hmm. and also keeps, for the most part, although with some exceptions, the states off their backs. Okay. So this is kind of a carve out in states. And if you look at a lot of these development programs, it didn't really help. But there's one exception, and it's important, gaming and casinos. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because um, American Indian tribes figured out that they didn't fall under state law. So state laws that limited the amount you could win at a casino were not valid. So they could open up a casino. And if you really wanted a game, I'm not a gamer. I'm not a gambler, but you really want to make money. You want to make it as much as you can. So you want to go to one of these casinos and you want to do it. So that did infuse money into, into these tribes. But a lot of these were very, very small programs. You know, it was like, you know, um, handicraft type industries, very light um, manufacturing, tourism. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, well, look, uh, thank you everyone for coming today and, and sharing this uh, engagement. Engagement's a good part of uh, history groups in general, economic or other. It's uh, a pleasure to have been involved today, and I, I certainly enjoyed it, and I hope you have too. And thank you. And I should give them the scene of the last um, presenter and the opening comments of the first presenter. I apologize for missing to the bulk of the countries, but. Um, so it's a thing I shouldn't remember. I'm sorry for forgetting that. Okay, lovely to see you and uh, see you at the next one. Thank yes, you. Thanks, Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>